people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. India will now be manufacturing Novavax's COVID-19 vaccine. The decision comes in line with country's efforts to ramp up vaccination drive in order to achieve its target of immunizing 900 million adult population by the end of this year. Third stage trials of the vaccine have shown 90% efficacy against the virus and is expected to become one of the major fighting weapons against the pandemic. Meanwhile, India is making its immunization program more inclusive by reaching out to all citizens through all possible efforts. Long-awaited Novavax's COVID-19 vaccine is all set to be rolled out in the market and India, the biggest producer of vaccines, will be one of its manufacturing partners. In January, the American biotechnology firm had announced that trials in Britain showed 96.4% efficacy against the original strain of SARS-CoV-2 virus and 86.3% efficacy against the B.1.1.7 variant. Experts say Novavax, which is easy to store and transport as compared to other U.S. vaccines, can play a key role in India's vaccination drive which is ramping up with each passing day. New Delhi has a target of immunizing 900 million people, thereby requiring 1,800 million doses by the end of the year. The efficacy and positive results of this study augur very well for our nation, because on our soil, this vaccine will be produced, hopefully in very large quantities, there will be some gap for a while when the production picks up, um, production uh, uh, ramps up, but also regulatory processes and regulatory requirements are met. Experts, however, say that this is not going to be smooth. While the Serum Institute of India is all set to produce the vaccines, the U.S. is still not supplying the essential raw material required in manufacturing. And this is despite Washington lifting ban after global opposition to its export ban a few weeks back. Meanwhile in India, where the health facilities overwhelmed due to a sudden and unprecedented surge in the rate of infections in May, the situation is stabilizing, with cases declining sharply in the past couple of weeks. Capital New Delhi recorded a little over 100 cases on 17 June. India has also administered over 258 million doses at one of the fastest speeds globally. The government says it will be over 120 million doses per month from July. The government is also reaching out to even people living in the remotest corners of the country to educate and immunize. Medical teams can be seen overcoming treacherous terrains to reach out to people. This team trekked more than six hours on foot and ponies to reach nomadic and shepherd tribes in the mountains. इनको अवेयरनेस भी नहीं होती है और ये ऐसे एरियाज में रहते हैं जो कि बहुत हार्ड टू रीच है जहां गोडू पे जाना पड़ता है कहीं पैदल चलना पड़ता है तो वहां जैसे हमने आज आडू से शुरू किया पहले हम सलर से सुबह 5 बजे निकले फिर हम आडू पहुंच गए 6:30 7:00 के करीब आडू से हमने मार्च शुरू किया फिर आधे रास्ते हमने घोड़े भी लिए अपने वैक्सीनेशन टीम को साथ उठा के तो क्योंकि नीचे जो एरियाज है जो सिटीज है टाउन्स है वहां तो हर कोई पहुंचता है लेकिन ये एरियाज में पहुंचना थोड़ा कठिन भी होता है लेकिन बहुत जरूरी है As the number of vaccination is picking pace and infection rate is coming down the government also eased restrictions on some federally protected monuments From the famed Taj Mahal and New Delhi's Red Fort and Qutub Minar some sites have been set open for tourists 
the government says it is cautiously treading ahead and will reverse its decisions on easing restrictions if the predicted third wave appears to enter the country. However, it says it will do everything to prevent it through a holistic strategy. Moving on. As Afghans grow insecure in an increasingly hostile situation following Taliban's escalated attacks, the global organizations are bracing up for massive displacement, which they anticipate might follow the departure of foreign forces from the country. While the talks between the two sides, the Kabul administration and the Taliban are underway, most of the observers are skeptical of it, leading to any fructiferous conclusion. It's only been weeks since the US-led NATO forces started cutting down on the number of troops present in the war-torn country. The insurgent Taliban have come out all guns blazing. In a clear hint of what would follow, the attacks have risen sharply. The international organizations working in the country are their prime targets. The others too, including the ISIS, have found an opportunity to research, triggering fear among the civilians who had endured a brutal Taliban rule from 1996 to 2001. Refugee Agency of United Nations anticipates a massive displacement within Afghanistan and from Afghanistan to other countries in months following the foreign group's exit. What we have observed in Afghanistan in the past couple of years is a rise in violence in various parts of the country. And with the withdrawal of the, of the international troops, this is possibly or likely going to become worse and therefore we are doing contingency planning inside the country for further displacement and in neighboring countries in case people might cross borders. However, what is also very important to note is that there are talks uh, between the Taliban and the government. The observers say the fear and panic is for real as the Taliban have vowed for years to kill those who have worked for US or NATO. If things go bad, they say, then a major part of the 40 million Afghan population will come under Taliban's influence and it will have no option but to flee. According to UNHCR, there are currently some 2.5 million registered refugees from Afghanistan globally while another 4.8 million have been displaced within the country. After 20 years, the United States has started a withdrawal of its remaining 2,500 troops and aims to be completely out of the country by September 11. Around 7,000 non-US forces from mainly NATO countries along with Australia, New Zealand and Georgia are also planning to leave by September 11. Up to three or four or five years ago, there was a lot more attention for a 10 or 15 year period from the international community on Afghanistan. And that helped contain problems there because there was a lot of engagement. Uh, from the wider world, in the region, um, in across the world, actually. That definitely has dissipated and weakened. And that um, that is a sort of problem when it comes to drawing attention to the needs of Afghanistan and getting support for them. The Afghan problem is not just about the displacement of civilians, but it is multidimensional. The United Nations estimates put Afghanistan among countries that are in dire need of humanitarian assistance.
It says some 18.4 million people, almost half the country's population, is in need of help. It has also appealed for $1.3 billion in funding for 2021. So far, it has only received about 23% of that. And despite the two sides holding multiple discussions and resuming the peace talks after a halt, the experts and the government of Afghanistan appears unsure of achieving anything significant. And observers who back the decision of UN say it is better to acknowledge the alarm and prepare beforehand than to regret the Taliban carnage that might follow later. Moving on. Vaccine inequity has left many countries and communities desperate for the dose. While wealthy American and European countries have pre-ordered a large chunk of vaccines to be manufactured in coming months, people in the low-income countries of Africa and Asia do not have any specific timeline as to when they will receive the jab. And in such a situation, imagine the condition of refugees who already live on the edge. Today, we show you how hundreds of thousands of Rohingya who have been sheltering in Bangladesh camps are waiting and appealing for the vaccines. The COVID wave that has swept across the world hasn't spared the refugees living in Cox's Bazar. Infection has claimed several lives and the refugees stand vulnerable to variants and corona waves that experts fear could take a disastrous toll. They are now urging the government and the global organizations to arrange vaccines for them. A Rohingya community leader in Bangladesh called for coronavirus vaccines to be arranged for people living in the world's largest refugee settlement. Doctors working in the camp said that the facility was seeing about 20 to 30 positive patients a day, although the virus spread had not been as serious as feared in the densely populated camps. There have been 1,452 confirmed COVID-19 cases among Rohingya refugees. Around 35 people have died so far. Bangladesh government says it has sought COVID-19 vaccines for Rohingya refugees from the United Nations and other donor agencies, but the timeline has not been clear as yet. Dhaka put a large number of Rohingya camps under lockdown in the last weeks of May and says curbs will be eased as the number of cases decline. Rohingya say they are scared despite the low infection rate and they must be vaccinated. <laughs> Bangladesh's vaccination drive suffered a blow after India, the world's biggest vaccine maker, put a temporary halt on vaccine export following an overwhelming surge in domestic cases. Since starting its vaccination drive in February, Bangladesh has so far fully vaccinated only 2.6% of its 170 million people. 
However, these figures are not true when it comes to refugees living in camps inside their own territory. Nearly one million Rohingya are living in camps in the border district of Cox's Bazar since fleeing a military crackdown in Myanmar's Rakhine state nearly four years ago. Experts say they must be immunized, not just for themselves, but for the safety of the entire country and the world. And now in our section of Asia this week, the story is from across the continent that made news this week. Nepalese authorities carried out rescue operations after flash floods killed over half a dozen and left at least 20, including six foreign nationals, missing. Media reports said that foreign nationals were from India and China. The government has deployed resources to help assist in rescue and evacuation operations. Witnesses said several people in Milamchi had moved to higher grounds with their belongings while army helicopters were rescuing those trapped in marooned houses. Authorities urged people living along the Naraini River, which flows into India as Gandak, to remain alert as the river was flowing above the danger mark. Nepal and Bhutan have been lashed by heavy rains in the past five days as the annual monsoon season began. The trial against ousted Myanmar leader Aung San Suu Kyi has begun. The Nobel Peace Prize laureate faces three cases at the specially built court in the capital Naypyidaw, Daw, where she had already appeared at the preliminary hearings. Two of the cases are linked to the possession of the radios and one under the Natural Disaster Management Law for breaching coronavirus regulations while campaigning for the elections she won last November. She also faces charges of incitement and more serious charges of violating the Official Secrets Act and under the anti-corruption law. Suchi's supporters, however, say that charges are politically motivated and designed to end the political life of a woman who championed democracy for decades under previous military administrations, much of the time under house arrest. NYK is a global transport company that has been a major contributor in the world economy and has helped improving the quality of life of people around the globe. The motto of NYK Group mission is bringing value to life. The group has announced the NYK Group ESG story which declared the policy of United Management Strategy of ESG in February 2021. The NYK Group's guiding principles for the future will contribute to the world's environment and people. The invention of drones is helpful in providing a clearer and a natural view of the cities, including the dangerous spots. This promising future of drone is pushing Japanese people to go to private schools for learning to become a drone pilot. The courses are so easy that a mere training of two days can make a person become an amateur pilot. Reaching to the professional level takes four more days. It is easy after two days of training once the amateur level is reached. ま、今後の仕事の事業展開の一環として、まずは資格を取得するということで考えております。建物の高いところの点検だとか、あの、ま、人が物に登ってみんなければいけないところ、そこを低い安全な場所で確認するという作業に使おうと思っています。Japan's property law considers the air up to 300 meters high to be owned by the owner of the property. 
Thus, the property owner can object to passage of drone, which usually fly at an altitude of no more than 150 meters. It is the reason for the idea of renting owner's air. Some companies are now operating air corridor along route between post office, shopping centers, hospital and village in need of delivery service. The rental value is calculated depending on the time the aircraft passes over the property. For every three seconds, it can earn few US cents. With these airplanes expected to be crowded with drones, the owners of the property in Japan can actually say that money is falling from the sky. Moving on to our cultural lineup of the show, we take you to the sixth shrine of Golden Temple in Amritsar city where devotees gathered to mark the death anniversary of spiritual leader Guru Arjan Dev. He was the first of the two gurus martyred in the Sikh faith and fifth of the ten total Sikh gurus. He compiled the first official edition of the Sikh scripture called the Adi Granth which later expanded into the Guru Granth Sahib. Have a look. Hundreds of Sikh devotees gathered at Golden Temple, the Sikhism's holiest shrine in India's northern Amritsar city, to mark the dead anniversary of the fifth spiritual leader, Guru Arjan Dev. Born in 1563 in Punjab's Tarn Tarn district, Guru Arjan Dev was martyred on June 16, 1606, and he was executed on the orders of Mughal Emperor Jahangir after refusing to convert to Islam. According to the Hindu Almanac, the martyrdom day of Guru Arjan Dev is observed on Jet Sudi 4, which was also on June 14 this year. Devatis strong the temple in large numbers on this day and take holy dips in the sacred pond inside the temple premises. Today, there is a lot of warm in June, a month. There is a lot of warm in the sun. There is a lot of warm in the sun. There is a lot of warm in the sun. There is a lot of warm in the sun. सिखी ना जोड़िया कि कभी भी डोलना नहीं अपना तर्मनी शर्दना जहाँ गिर नहीं हो कि यासी इस्लाम को बोलो तानू सारा को शर्दवां के पर गुरु से नहीं को बोल की तीस ही दी हाली को ना तो शक्तियाँ सारा कोश सब कोश सी सिक्स ऑब्जर्व दिस ओकेजन एस चाबिल डे इन हिज रिमेम्ब्रेंस ऑन दिस डे कोल्ड रोस मिल्क वाटर and sweet drink are served to the devotees to provide relief to them from cold weather. And it is considered as the prasad. It is believed that a lot of people come to Guru to confess their sins and repent or to have their moral dilemmas resolved and no one went away disappointed or dissatisfied. पवित्र स्थान है जिथे दर्शन करके आत्मा बड़ा ही सुून मिलता है और गुरु साहब की बड़ी कृपा है कि इस स्थान के उत्ते दूर दुराडे तो अच्छ बड़ी वीडी गिनती जड़िया दर्शन कर आई हैं और उन्होंने वास्ते ठंडे मिठे जल दियाँ छबील होर भी कई प्रकार के लंगर तैयार किए गए हैं मैं गुरु साहब के चरणों के अरदस करती हाँ कि सारिया संगत के सिर के उत्ते मेहर भरया हाथ रख The major contributions of Guru Arjan Dev were re-editing and compilation of the present Sikh Guru Granth Sahib, the Holy Spiritual Book, and the construction of the Harmindra Sahib, popularly known as the Golden Temple in Amritsar. Every year, a batch of Sikh pilgrims, also known as Jatha, travels to Pakistan to mark the martyrdom day of 5th spiritual Guru Arjan Dev at Gurudwara Dehra Sahib in Lahore. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care. Subscribe Tag TV YouTube channel and press the notification button.